Surprise! <laughs> we are back. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the creator, e the created economy. How do I, I can't even know the name of our own show. Uh, this is our weekly news show on everything happening in the creator economy. Uh, we'll be bringing you a roundup of the latest news, commentary, interviews, and of course, some deep dives with experts like our friend Sarah, who will be joining us very shortly uh, on everything happening in the creator economy. So we go live on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, you can find out more over at created.show. It is the official show page where we have our episodes of, and all the details about upcoming episodes. Uh, but if you want long form content, because that's more your thing, head over to createdeconomy.com. That is where we post up our show notes and lots of other interesting things. Uh, it's also an opportunity for you to sign up to be a guest because guess what? We need more guests uh, in, the, in the long term. By the way, we are streaming right now on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, uh, sometimes LinkedIn, but Ken deleted that this week. So blame, blame him for us. <laughs> You're just going to automatically throw me under the bus. Let, we're not, even, we're not even five minutes in. It would be better if LinkedIn actually allowed you to say schedule your events to start, you know, like when you needed to start them as opposed to having to schedule them an hour in advance. Uh, but it's been a busy week, so we haven't been able to do that. But we are on Clubhouse. We are on Twitter spaces uh, all right now. So feel free to join us there for audio. Of course, you can join us for video as well. I need to go share a link. Uh, but before we do that, Ken, uh, how you been, man? How's it been? How's it going out there? You had a birthday. I'm I did. I did. Apparently, uh, 365 days. I decided to cycle up, level up. Um, so now I'm uh, in my my the season finale of my 30s was was spectacular. Uh, I am now in the fourth season. I've been renewed for another four four decade uh, for my for another decade. So that that's always a plus. Uh, but as you can how are, tell, how are the upfronts this year? Oh man, they they were horrible. They were horrible. You know, it's like all still TBDs type of thing. So we'll we'll see how it goes. Uh, but as you can tell, I'm I'm around. I'm back to sporting a tie. I'm pulling the uh, what is the what is that 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 eccentric uh, uh, stock guy on CNBC? You know the one that 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 uh, that uh, uh, Mark Benioff always talks to. You know it's like that's that's kind. I'm kind of pulling that type of energy right now and that type of look. So uh, you, know, you know my favorite line. What was that movie? Uh, 25th Hour. Um, oh yeah yeah Ed yeah. Norton and the other guy and. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite lines of that movie was uh, the guy was like, you look like an effing optical illusion. You know, you're wearing a striped tie with a striped shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to throw it off here. It's like, I could have worn green, but you know, green on video was just probably not a good idea. Well, by the way, um, Ken is not wearing a striped tie or striped shirt for anyone who's listening. Uh, well, I am but, wearing a striped shirt, just not a striped tie. No, not a striped tie. I mean, that would make you an optical illusion, yeah, uh, well. you know. Uh, well, by the way, as they say time. in the business, don't wear striped clothing on uh, on on video. Well, go big or go home, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I, I think we're we're back. Uh, this is uh, episode four. Uh, a, a little disclosure: apologies for the uh, noise you might hear in the background. Uh, turns out that uh, we're doing uh, some creator sp uh, space type stuff in my uh, condo building. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's all part of the act, right? Uh, but thank you all for joining us and looking forward to another great conversation this time with our very dear friend who we've known for, oh, good Lord, so many years. And, and, and we've had so many amazing Not conversations. She's old. It's no, 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 no. Old. We, we are old. We are old. Not her. Uh, but she is, she's done such a, 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 an amazing, she has had, had an amazing career, not only as a creator, uh, but, but as a, as a journalist, as, as a, as a founder, as a hacker, a developer. And, and now she's an, a, an investor doing some fantastic stuff. And I'm sure we'll have a lively conversation about what it all means to the creator economy. So uh, we'll bring Sarah Austin on in a little oh, bit. And, and a creator. And a creator, oh. Austin. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. Come on. I, I, come I, I, I thought you I skipped that part, actually. Well, um. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she's all of this. She's, she, is, she is an amazing, uh, 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 amazing individual that, that, that basically – like I'm, I'm wondering 
is there anything that she can't do? Like it, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic. But uh, we'll we'll learn we'll learn you, more you about you her. Should keep all the flatter for when they when the the guest is is visible with us. Now, you, you know, at least we can see the preview. <laughs> <laughs> she, can, she can catch the replay later on. Yeah. We'll, we'll make it as a meme. You know, it'll, it'll wind, probably wind up being as a LinkedIn uh, a testimonial sometime. You, you, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. All right. But anyways. Well, we got a lot to cover this week as per usual, so let's jump right into it. Um, so yes, it is uh, June 9th, episode four. Thank you for being with us today. We have a lot of news. I mean, there's just always too much news at this point. Um, you should see the fights that Ken and I have about who gets to tell which story. So um, <laughs> on that note, let's let's jump right into it. Uh, first up, let's go our first segment on uh, creator economics, though. And so, um, I can it was this yours? This was mine, yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Although you did try and poach it, uh, so <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing about collaboration: like you need to really lay down. Like it, things can be very territorial. So, uh, but our first story comes from uh, uh, is, is specifically around a, a a graph that was in an eMarketer report. Uh, basically, it, it highlights like which which of the social media platforms are the most creator friendly, right? And it, it, the thing with that is uh, it's like most of the results are all around Facebook properties, which is not necessarily so surprising because they are the they have the biggest reach. Facebook properties have the biggest reach. But out of all, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or whatever else they have, I, I think ultimately what probably shouldn't surprise anybody is that Instagram or Instagram stories tops TikTok, uh, tops uh, YouTube and uh, Pinterest and Twitter, Snapchat, and all these other things. So this is it, there's a high likelihood for brands, for marketers, to really engage with influencers there. And as we get through the rest of the news for this week, uh, it'll be pretty apparent to see what's being done on from the Instagram and Facebook side to encourage and entice more creators onto their platform. So, uh, well, it seems like we're in an arms race again. So. Uh it's coming soon. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Pinterest live streaming though. I thought that was interesting. Uh, I think we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, next up related, by the way, there's a lot of news about this topic actually. And, and there's a lot of discussion going on right now about, you know, how much the, you know, in general, I think Ken, like the take rates that different um, organizations and platforms actually are the charges they're exacting from creators. Uh, and one of the biggest uh, um, sort of takers in the space is Apple, right? Um, and so there's uh, increasing discussion. Uh, Facebook announced actually, right, that they were going to be disclosing how much Apple was taking from you as part of uh, them delivering their fees to in their new dashboard. Uh, but uh, the information has a good article um, about Apple's brewing battle over creator commission. Uh, in case you don't know, Apple takes 30%. Um, I believe they've, didn't they lower it though to 15%? It, it depends. It's it's all After based on year. your yeah on your on how much revenue you get. And but even that's very tricky, right? I mean, it's like thirty percent is the default for for Google and Apple, and they are getting By into way, a lot Google of trouble. Google doesn't seem to take the arrows the way Apple does, though. Well, I, I think the the Google Apple's it more in the in the limelight now because of all their because their dirty laundry, all the inner workings has been aired at in their loss in the in, in this mm -hmm. antitrust oh, lawsuit right. it was the Epic from Games. Epic Games. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so they're throwing that all out there. And then there's another article uh, that, that that came out. I believe it's from The Verge that that basically showed that look, there's a, a like Roblox is was not considered a game, so there's some loophole now. So Apple has gone through and changed their policy in terms of like what's considered a game versus a content creator. And then there's some leeway for them to fuss around with that. So it's, it's not really a hundred percent clear in terms of the, the, the creator commissions, but I think the, that's actually going to be a, play a big factor over the court over the next few weeks or not years in terms of how these platforms cater towards creators. And, and I think there's a lot of uh, soul searching that not only these platforms need to do, but creators in terms of yeah. where they need to go and how much money they they stand to potentially lose. As well, we'll it. have to talk to Sarah about this topic too, because I know one of the, the reasons people like or advocates of crypto is that there are no fees per se. Mm -hmm. um, there may be gas, uh, but there are no fees, right? And so this is one of the appeals of uh, a blockchain-based uh, universe as well. Uh, what's up, our, our next story? Ah, I, I did come across this yesterday. It was just a, a chart shared by the information as well. 
Um, really sort of highlighting all the deals that A16Z has put forward. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the reasons for their um, investment so strongly in this area is because they have their crypto fund. Um, and so they've made a significant number of investments into sort of the crypto ecosystem. But of course, they've invested in a number of other things that you may have heard of, for example, like Clubhouse, um, PS Turntable FM is back again. Really? Like, what happened there? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> Uh, we used to listen, we used to be on that all the time, actually. So <clears throat> can't complain about that. But there are several NFT investments in here, and I definitely want to ask Sarah about these uh, when we get uh, back to here. Maybe we'll bring this chart back um, in there. But yeah, um, Andreessen, I, I would say, is certainly a prolific investor in the space. Uh, but there are a number of other great VCs uh, and investors out there. So um, hopefully, we'll have some of them on here soon uh, to talk with us. Um, Last article uh, was one that came up uh, not too, not too, very recently, actually, <clears throat> New York Times talking about how young creators are burning out and breaking down. You know, the interesting thing here is um, I feel like I'm going to have a breakdown just trying to produce a daily, sh uh, weekly show with you. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so I can't imagine being on the hook. Um, and, and you've seen some of these stories, right? Like and you, I remember uh, reading about Ninja, like he had to like figure out or calculate the loss from going on his honeymoon. Cause like that six days cost him like half a million dollars in annual subscriptions or something like that. Yeah. Um, it isn't always on proposition. Um, there are a lot of challenges. There's a lot of pressure. Um, some of it I think is the same things I preach to other founders though, is that <clears throat> you can and should actually still have a life um, outside of your work. And part of it is the pattern that you set up from the beginning. Right. Um, unfortunately, algorithms do govern a lot of the success, um, uh, the determination or make uh, play a big role in the success factors for creators. And so that cadence and that regularity can often be a critical part of your success. But um, if you are a creator out there and you have got, you know, have you been suffering with sort of feelings like uh, of distress or depression? By all means, we'd love to hear from you, but also we want you to know you're not alone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is better to build something that lasts a long time than if something's just successful for a very short time. Uh, you've got your whole life in front of you. And, and, and this is a good read, though, because it does go behind the scenes with several TikTokers to sort of talk about some of the challenges they faced, um, some of the emotional drain that goes with it, and sort of that that perpetual sort of hamster wheel that you can feel like you get on, you know, to to be a creator. I, like I, I could say from experience, just Ken and I just doing this show, we probably talk every day about some part of it. And we're not even producing every day, right? Uh, and our produce, production workflow is like the dog crappiest version of like what you could call uh, producing a show. Uh, we don't do any editing. We don't have any of the fancy cool stuff that like like actual you know other creators out there are doing. So um, I can understand uh, and relate to this feeling for sure. But let's go on. We've got some YouTube news uh, as well, just continuing through. Um, Ken, this was yours. Yes. So, uh, it, in a oddly like a 180 switch to the to to what we talked about, and, and mental health is is first and foremost. I think w what we we're talking about earlier, way back in the beginning, is of the show is are there are all these platforms that are top of the line for for brands, right? And what YouTube has going for it, which was which was I guess formally announced or formally revealed, and if you could, if you will, uh, by Fast Company, is this creator in residence program that uh, that YouTube has. And it, I remember back in the day, I think this was like probably like five or plus years ago uh, when I was writing for the Next Web. Uh, I visited a YouTube Spaces uh, facility in in Los Angeles, right, just north of the airport, and. The whole premise of that particular space. This is a physical space where where creators can go and produce content, produce their their work, and and in this you know with top of the line equipment. But with this creator in residence, this is more like an incubator, so an incubator type of program. So they will they, what YouTube does is they will choose a select number of of creators and artists and influencers, and they will work with them to and give them access to. Uh, to to tools, they will allow them to kind of really beta test and preview uh, what's what's coming down the pipe for what YouTube's doing, and at some point, and and they will and YouTube will even visit them at their uh, at these creators' uh, uh, homes to help them help offer the whatever guidance they need, and the the potential afterwards is like, look, once you've done that, you could you might be able to advance into uh, some special funds, right? Like 
For example, the the Fast Company article cited the the Black Creators Fund that YouTube set up a while back. Uh, so this is an opportunity to do that. So this is another incentive that YouTube's doing to encourage uh, uh, creators to do that because they feel like, hey, we are the we are the one that most people associate from when it comes to creators and influencers and those type of and those original types of content. Uh, and so we we have that capabilities, that expertise compared to Facebook and Snapchat and everybody else. So uh, this is, a, as, as Greg, you pointed out, another ar- part of the arms race to to uh, amass a, lar- a loyal following of, of creators uh, if, in the future. Absolutely. Um, another in other YouTube news uh, last week, they reported or at least through a press release that in the last 12 months, YouTube has paid out $4 billion to the music industry. I mean, I think it's easy to lose sight of this, but um, YouTube is one of the most uh, um, viable sources for creators, I think, to monetize their efforts, right? Um, they pay out like, where, where, whereas everyone else is, you know, just getting started, maybe a billion here, a billion there. YouTube is doing tens of billions of dollars paid to creators, uh, largely, and, and through an array of services. So I think it's important to remember the predominantly still, I think is still the, um, the AdSense sort of advertising driven stuff, but increasingly memberships and tips and a number of other ways to monetize. So, um, don't sleep on YouTube, you know, maybe it feels a little old fashioned to, for some folks or, you know, a lot of folks are on TikTok, but you're trying to figure out how to monetize, but the YouTube side definitely you know, sort of where it, it's a bit more prolific in terms of like, uh, tried and true and steady revenue. Um, once you can get to certain sizes, um, unlike say, um, other platforms like Twitch and, uh, maybe TikTok, where you might be able to grow an audience. Um, Twitch is actually pretty hard too. Uh, but on TikTok, I know a lot of people can grow up on TikTok pretty quickly, but doesn't necessarily always lead to revenue. Uh, but YouTube still, still blowing it, uh, out of the water here. This is, uh, mostly related by the way to music stuff. So TikTok is one of, um, one of the, a better way to get paid for music in a lot of ways than say even Spotify, actually, um, if you have a <clears throat> content ID and, and some of the other features that are enabled there. Um, Instagram news, what else we got going on over here now? Uh, let's see. So Instagram had, as we talked about, I think it was a few weeks ago, um, Instagram has their creator week, right? And um, on the eve of, uh, of this creator week, uh, Mark Zuckerberg came out and said like, look, we will, uh, we will tr- uh, take care of, we will work with creators in terms of revenue share. And there, there's no rev share program in place with Instagram right now. But according to Mark Zuckerberg, if there was one, they Facebook will have it be less than the 30% of, uh, of Apple and Google. And what this all kind of span came across with the Apple, um, and, and Apple's Epic Games trial. And there's certainly no love loss between Apple and Facebook uh, in light of the Apple's new privacy features in, in place. Uh, but here's where, where it gets interesting, right? As we're talking, again, this arms race that's uh, for, for creators, Instagram is making it easier for, for uh, creators to make money and through like having some sort of a native affiliate link uh, opportunity within Instagram. So you creators can make more money. They will be able to, um, uh, they will be able to even be able they might be able to sell merchandise further, further down the line. So there are a lot of interesting things at play for, for creators to do, uh, to, to take advantage with it within Instagram. And I, I like, I think Instagram will certainly have it, it, it enough ammo ahead in its in its arsenal to take on uh TikTok and 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 YouTube. So I think in over the next year it'll be very fascinating to see how much more uh, uh the brands care, feel Instagram and Facebook will will stand up against more traditional ones such as YouTube or Twitch. Yeah, I'm well, I'm not going to hold my breath. I mean, I know the tools are being deployed, but we also have like a decade of them not paying a penny to creators. So That's uh, true. I'm not going to be grateful. Damn it. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. Some news on Twitch. This oh, one's yours, Ken. Twitch, Twitch, Twitch. I mean, we're talking about like the big, a lot of these traditional social media players, but I think we got to, we can't ignore the fact that Twitch turns 10. Turn 10 it's now 10 years old, right? It, it, that, that birthday's passed, but it's 10 years old. But what's fascinating is like this Wired article, cons- like the, uh, 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 the, a Twitch exec calls Twitch the the quote original player in the creator economy. That seems kind of 
interesting and almost almost dubious. Um, I, I think I'd be very curious to, to hear your thoughts, Greg. Uh, but the especially since YouTube's been around a lot longer. Uh, but it seems that in terms of, but for YouTube, they're just producing content that's just like, okay, we're here. While Twitch is more like, hey, let me, it's more dynamic. It's more about life. It's more about like, it's that just a TV type of modality that, that was, that's how, I, how it got started. Yeah, I'm torn on this. Uh, I, I would probably, I, I could reasonably give Twitch credit for being uh, uh, the original to some degree, right? I certainly for live streaming. Right. Um, I, I think there wasn't really any. I mean, back then there were other things, those weird things. Right. Murray. Murray says YouTube is the original. YouTube was definitely the original for published videos. Um, Twitch is probably the OG for, I would say, streaming user, user generated streaming video or content. Right. Um, but, you know. Um, Twitch has a lot of interesting capabilities that now when you look at the space, What's happening? People are actually copying more of what's in Twitch and bringing it outwards than what they're bringing than like the other way around, right? Like the video part, YouTube was brave and early on in, in sort of getting video in, onto the web, but all the other tools that are happening to the current like version or iteration of the creator economy that we're looking at, it's actually the community-based tools and the subscriptions and, uh, mm -hmm. and the tipping and all these other uh, features and capabilities that exist on the Twitch universe that are actually being mirrored now in other places. So I will give Twitch some credit for doing a lot um, for the creator space uh, from a very early days. Obviously, YouTube was uh, one of the leaders and the first in, in sort of getting video online and networked, right, uh, in the manner that it was. Um, and, you know, we said we, we uh, got tons of respect for, for what YouTube does as well. Um, but yeah, they're both important to the ecosystem. We think they have lots of life left in them for sure. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, by the way, um, that's the end of our new segment, and we're going to give you a chance to, if you're in the audience listening anywhere, we're going to bring Sarah in and have her do, say, before we do her intro, we'll actually just have her react to the news. She wasn't even paying attention much. Um, <laughs> we probably should have told her we were going to quiz her on the news. After. Uh, but, um, no, but just in case you didn't know, uh, we are always live tweeting out um, the links to all these articles. So, if you're watching us, uh, check the comment stream there. If you're on Twitter, check Twitter for the, the links to these posts. And, of course... Uh, you know, we have a Flipboard uh, over at, at Created Economy. Uh, there's a link on screen now. Uh, but if you head over to our Created Economy Flipboard, you can find all of the news that we considered even before the ones that we picked to talk about today. So with that, why don't we bring our guest, Sarah, on to uh, interact and react? Um, so this is the part where we like to um, sort of like just do our quick reactions to news before we get into the full interview. If anyone's listening out there and wants to come on up, feel free to raise your hand and we'll bring you up as well. Sarah, how are you? Hey, guys. It's really good to see you. It's been a while since it's COVID and everything. <laughs> it's been forever. Uh, I mean, none of us live in the same state anymore. How do you like that? Oh, where are you? I'm in Denver. He's in. I'm Seattle. in Washington. Yeah, yep. and oh, you're the only now. one that's left. <laughs> see, see, we 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 moved just so it made it easier. It gives us all an excuse to travel once everything's all yeah. all said and done. Like we can all visit more places. <laughs> yeah, I certainly would love to go to Denver. It's so beautiful there. Um, and then I'll hold it down in California, so you guys can come visit <laughs> me. But yeah, I didn't know that you guys left. So that's sad. So many people are flocking to other states um, ever since everyone works from home. Um, but yeah, just my commentary on the news. I think the thing that really stands out to me is um, the YouTube program for creators to give feedback to uh, YouTube, so that can be, um, you know, iterated into the user experience. Uh, I think that Instagram should have done that when they made that change. I don't know if you guys remember when Instagram made the algorithm change so that content creators were forced to post two photos a day versus yeah. one photo a day. And it caused a lot of creator fatigue. And no, they're lot, worried about uh, hiding likes, but they're but then they're forcing you to post more, right? <laughs> yeah, they, you know, they're they're causing their influencers and their stars to have to create lower quality content in order to meet the demands to keep their followers increasing and and keep them fed with uh, even just being able to populate their news feeds. 
Um, and that's that was something that a lot of creators complained about. So, you know, YouTube probably is learning from these mistakes in the industry. I mean, it's like, yeah, maybe you call that a mistake, but then look at Instagram as number one on the chart for uh, the number one demand for marketers. So I think it, the percentage was 97% of marketers are choosing Instagram for advertisements. Um, so yeah, so maybe just that's what they care about at the end of the day is um, serving those ads. But you know, YouTube, I think, sees the long-term value in investing in their creators and trying to build uh, products that the creators um, are okay with and that match their lifestyle. So yeah. Sarah, in terms of like your your background is is extensive in terms of creating content. Like on you, you were you you started Pop Seventeen back many years ago. Uh, you worked with a lot of brands, uh, but as you look at the landscape now, if you had to go back and do it all over again, which of these platforms would you probably put more of your time into? Would it still be YouTube, or would it be Instagram, TikTok, or Twitch, or any of the anything else? Uh, that's a good question. And you're just as a career trying to get on as many platforms as possible, but then you have to adjust your content because it's not always one size fits all, which can be pretty exhausting. I like what you guys are doing um, with your live content. So, you know, clearly coming from some creators with some experience as well. Uh, but I would say YouTube to answer your question. Yeah, YouTube just seems to be. Is that as an individual creator or like as a business? Like, so if you were advising a business, would you have a different answer? No, I would also say YouTube just because, um, you know, YouTube has excellent SEO and it's become the de facto search engine. A lot of people prefer to receive their information through videos. And so you're seeing more and more search uh, over on, on YouTube search. So mm -hmm. it's a great place for discovery. Uh, it's a great place for businesses to attract their target customers and that's you know something that's morphing and changing as new features evolve with web 3.0 and everything that's going on with the future evolution of technology but it seems like youtube's pretty cutting edge and i think also that the technology always wins all right now let's do a quick transition here we are interviewing sarah and I, Sarah, we'd love for you to just be able to like, oh, how do I do this? This is so complicated. <laughs> like, like, I need to do this so that I could do this, right? Um, Sarah, can you just do a quick intro and tell everyone who you are before we jump in? Because we already have, we have a ton of questions. Okay, sure, no problem. Um, so, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here live with y'all. I am Sarah Austin. I am knee deep into cryptocurrencies, so. I've kind of transitioned into Web 3.0 after an extensive background um, as early dating back to Web 1.0 um, when I was at Stanford as a teenager. Um, I was actually around the valley uh, in Palo Alto for the very beginning of, of Web 1.0 and everyone thought that the money was in the protocol but then AOL came out and Yahoo and next up Google and everyone learned that the money was actually not in the protocol. But this time around, I think that the money is in the protocol as we're seeing with cryptocurrencies. So I'm um, really interested in NFTs, uh, just being a content creator myself, I'm coming at NFTs um, after diving deep into financial instruments and understanding um, the entire ecosystem of uh, that is crypto and the history of crypto and uh, decentralized finance, DeFi. Um, I think you really have to know it all in order to fully you know, see the future of NFTs because it's the emergence. It's like finance and content coming together. The whole idea is you're cutting out the middlemen uh, you're going direct to the consumers and you're creating, you know, through smart contracts and technologies, uh, new distributed distributions um, and, and a new, completely new models for uh, content. And, you know, of course, brands are trying to get into this as well, because NFTs don't have to be just videos or art um, or music. They can be so much more than that. They could be this T-shirt I'm wearing. Um, it could be anything. So. 
So let's step back for a second real quick, though. Um, a lot of folks, there's a lot of different interpretations of Web 3.0, for example. Like, do you have a definition you like using or that you find helpful for people understanding sort of the broader sense of this? Sure. I mean, the way that I think of Web 3.0 is everything um, everything encompassing cryptocurrencies. Mm. Got you. Okay, that's good. Um, and um, I know you're working now a lot with NFTs, right? Uh, but you were doing crypto like way before, mm -hmm. right? I know like you've been involved with, with crypto. Do you want to, can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing crypto before NFTs? Because I think then we do have to dive into like some NFT things as well. Sure. I got into crypto by what, uh, writing white papers. So I'm a technical writer. Um, I contribute to a ton of magazines and publications over the years. Um, and as a writer, uh, back, you know, in this, this first bubble in 2017, um, right around that time, there was just all these um, Russians and Chinese that wanted uh, technical white papers in English. And so I ended up capturing some clients who wanted to pay me in Bitcoin um, because of the cross ease of cross-border payments with Bitcoin coming um, from these countries. And I was uh, interested in, in this space because one of my friends, uh, she's also a content creator, her name's Rachel Wolfson. And so she had been um, writing some papers and so she kind of, told me about this, um, you know, a while ago, like maybe it was 2016, you know, I got my first gig writing a white paper, um, coming up with some token economics as a result of that, um, researching a ton, um, you know, learning about the space. And, you know, voila, a few white papers later, uh, getting paid in Bitcoin, watching how that uh, space unfolded, started, you know, trading my Bitcoin, um, started investing it into different tokens, and then, you know, building out a portfolio and, you know, researching all of these companies. Um, it's been it's been interesting to see these projects take off and um, to kind of choose some of the best projects early on. Um, and sort of ride this decentralized finance wave and, and sort of see how it's settling in now uh, with content creators as NFTs are turning into a big trend. Mm. Ken, did you have anything? So, uh, Sarah, explain in, in, in layman's terms. Like, I've, I've, I've seen NFTs uttered, like, oh, uh, somebody's uh, putting out their NFTs, like, you have these, the, uh, all these memes that you've seen on social media. Oh, and they're now being auctioned off as as NFTs. Uh, we saw that record breaking, like Beeple's uh, work of art was sold for sixty nine million dollars, like this massive record as, in, as an as an NFT. Can you explain first of all, like what an NFT is, in just for layman's terms, and and then second, can we dive into how creators? If they're like, oh, we're seeing this trend, how do we get involved in this? Like, what do we need to do? to have a, a an nft and like what what do we do with it afterwards <laughs> sure so digital assets um are huge right now as we know we're all watching the news about bitcoin and elon's tweets um <laughs> you know a vital characteristic of a popular tradable currency is its fungibility Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're completely fungible. That means that each token is equally as valuable and indistinguishable from the other one. So if a currency uh, is non-fungible, then each transaction actually requires the buyer and the seller to agree on the token's value through a smart contract um, or a similar module um, on anything outside of the Ethereum network. Uh, but non-fungible tokens, these are called NFTs. They have a ton of use cases um, just beyond a medium of exchange of value. So uh, it's really become this niche in the industry. Um, and NFTs are just getting so much recognition from, um, you know, you mentioned Beeple's NFT selling for an exorbitant amount of money. Um, also, CryptoKitties and then, you know, NBA Top Shots, that's another 
um, example of an NFT company that um, is in the news a lot right now, sometimes maybe not like positive news, but there, there's a artist explosion and there's a, you know, in the area of monetizing digital artwork. Um, so instead of just carrying a monetary value, an NFT represents the value of a unique item that is completely different from a, an, and distinguishable um, from other items. So, you know, they cannot be replaced by another. They're totally different um, in their functions and what they do. And so, you know, uh, I think creators are trying to find that cool angle, like how do I package my content? How do I make it really different um, to distinguish this from this one from another one? So you think like kind of try to think of like a package deal. That's what I think the artists are trying to sell. Um, so just like a work of fine art, um, you know, you can you can that's completely indistinguishable from another work of fine art uh you can have replications of each just like you have a print of fine art so you could sell you know the original one and then you could sell you know the first 50 um you know uh copies so sorry let me ask you a question about this and um like i guess like so the cynical people out there um I, I consider myself cynical enough sometimes right <laughs> Um, would say like, I already have this thing. Um, so why, like, why buy it? Right. Um, like what, what are some of the underlying, like, I guess, motivation, like, why are people buying these things? Right. Like, um, I, I get like, obviously if I can make something and someone wants to buy it, cool. Like good, good for me to be able to sell it. What are there like any, um, patterns or trends or reasons you see people buying them? Right. Like, it, um, and, and I think like part of my, the cynicism, I guess, is we're still stuck in a physical world sort of context, right? Like, so, you know, like all the digital things didn't make sense to the people who were analog before, but now digital seems so native. But, you know, like we've always held art still kind of separate, right? Like, or digital art certainly had like a dip was a different domain. And it feels like it's catching up or getting parity with some of the, with the physical analog or art world now to some degree as well. Right. So, but are there any, any thoughts on motivations or why people are buying these? Um, you're sort of just like, what, what, is there something else? There's other things going on here at the same time. Right. And it, it's not just like the availability of crypto per se. Right. I, I think that, um, just like an art collector, you buy art because you want to add it to your collection and, maybe that collection will be worth something one day. So you like it, um, you wanna show it off to your friends, you have this ability to hang it on your wall, your friends can see it, they, they think it's cool, you get to enjoy it, you get to look at it. Um, so I think it's, it's similar to that, it, um, it's attractive to collectors, it's attractive to crypto traders, um, and to people who want to hold their digital assets uh, in new ways that they think uh, you know, instead of buying one thing that's like every other thing, you know, a Bitcoin is indistinguishable from another Bitcoin. They say, well, why don't I just hold this cool NFT? It does something. I get these val this value out of it. Um, like Gary Vee launched his uh, series of NFTs. Friends, what were they called? Yeah. Friends. Yeah. Yeah. You can put it up there. But he, you know, uh, with each one of these um, trading cards, you get a ticket to his uh, annual conference for something like five years, mm -hmm. maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, you get to have a, a all access pass. So people are coming up with new experiences um, and you know that's kind of up to the creators, but also there's a lot of technology uh, innovators, innovators out there and startup companies that are coming up with great ways to help the creators package um, these possibilities through new technologies that offer, you know, more options for creators to create content in this new model where you know you're not dependent on this middleman YouTube uh, or Instagram to 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 get you know your advertising revenue. Um, you know, actually, it kind of cuts out the advertising model altogether. I mean, in this new world of Web 3.0, there, <laughs> there really are no ads 
only the best content wins. So if brands want to get their uh, their their name out there, they're going to have to get really creative, work with the creators, and find new experiences in this economy. So I think like tickets are doing really well. People like um, access. People like experiences, tangible things. So like for example, this card unlocks you know, a bunch of different experiences. It's oh, not that's... the card. And then the card itself actually holds a value, a monetary value that you can sell, um, right? So, right. so Sarah, the, the, I just wanna, let's, let's point out like um, in recent news, uh, recent, recent days, there was uh, one company, one of, that raised uh, like tens of millions of dollars, right? And their whole thing is, fascinating about it is that it's backed by Quincy Jones and it's all for like musicians and artists. Right. And as we're talking about like what you can do with these type of things, can you explain like if I'm a musician, like what can I do with like what obviously right now there's, there's like live music isn't happening um, for maybe a little bit longer due to the pandemic. And so a lot of people are out of work. Uh, but there's they, uh, these artists want to maintain their uh, relationship with their fans and their community. Uh, so obviously they could put out their posts on like on social traditional social media. But if they want to have some sort of a a um, a Patreon type of experience, minus actually having it hosted on Patreon, where which might which would take some sort of a cut of the fees or whatever of this loyalty program. Uh, the subscription program, they could use an NFT this way. So they say, hey, you can buy a, an NFT of our latest uh, album cover, and that will get you uh, a, an access to a virtual show with us, uh, you know, and plus, you know, free merch, a discount on merchandise or blah, blah, blah. Is, is this kind of what could possibly be the, the potential of an NFT for 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 this for this type of uh, these type of professionals? I see what you're saying, um, like discounts on a T-shirt. Um, you know, I think it's just it's it's really this wide open space for these creators to come in. Um, you know, with the most creative ideas. Um, it's, you know, with blockchain technology, there's this ability to democratize the ownership um, and really bring that economic empowerment to the artists um, and to the fans because the fans get to have the opportunity to own their art. And, you know, it's, it's really up to uh, the artists to come up with um, the most creative ideas and uh, build those experiences for their fans. Um, and, and minting an NFT, it's never been um, easier than it is now. Um, How do you do it? Do you have a site you like or can we pull something up here for folks to look at? Um, sure. Why don't you pull up the one that um, Ken just mentioned? It's, it's one of oneof.com. <clears throat> Yeah, so you know, one of is a green NFT platform, and it was built on the Tezos blockchain. And Tezos uh, blockchain protocol is a long-lasting, energy-efficient blockchain, and you know, it's sustainable and it's low cost, which is really great for artists. Who Can you explain it real quick, uh, Sarah? Like, what's the process to make an NFT? Sure. So uh, you just go on and you mint an NFT. Um, you, ha you have your art, whatever it might be. Um, the one of platform is actually not live yet, but they did put out a launch. Um, a lot of people in the industry are talking about it. Um, but, you know, there's a there's a bunch of the, I think the most popular one that people mention is called OpenSea. Um, and they allow anyone to go on there and um, do what's called mint an nft so sort of think of it in web 2.0 like minting would be like an upload you know 
um, like upload a video, right? So that would be sort of the concept. Um, but with, when you mint it, but an NFT is, you know, it's a non-fungible token, so you're minting it. Um, on the Ethereum network, one thing that is uh, difficult for artists is that, you know, when you go, so OpenSea is on the Ethereum network, when you mint an NFT, you have high gas fees. And even if someone Ex gives Explain you gas for everybody. Oh, gas fees. Um, you know, there's uh, it's smart contracts are what Ethereum, they call them smart contracts. It's a contract that unlocks the block. There's a lot of um, steps involved. The more there is, the more congestion on the network um, that maybe wasn't built for this level of scale uh, and security you know, with that congestion can uh, be problematic because it causes higher, what are called gas fees. Um, so in order to mint an NFT, there's a fee. So if I just want to upload, right, like the concept of uploading a video to YouTube, it's free, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not really free, right? Like there are costs to YouTube involved with that. They make it free for the user um, because the Ethereum network is decentralized. Um, there are fees associated. So it could cost, you know, $200 to upload uh, your content, which isn't actually called upload. It would be called mint an NFT. Um, but just to give you some sort of conceptual comparable. Mm -hmm. Sure. <clears throat> and so uh, it's not necessarily the um, production resources that, crea that created that thing per se, right? So it's not like the, uh, say it was a, a piece of art, digital artwork, like it's not like the Photoshop file. It's it's whatever you put into the whatever you mint is in the thing, right? It's like the it's everything, the intellectual property, it's mm -hmm. it's you're selling it. So instead of streaming something on YouTube and people get to watch it, but you're ultimately the owner, um, you're actually selling this. So like this uh digital art piece here is going for two ETH. But when you go to buy that, you're going to have to pay uh, gas fees associated with it. Oh, and also, interestingly, um, here I know you, you have to use a cryptocurrency. Yes, you have to use a cryptocurrency. That's correct. So one thing um, that I did notice about one of is that anyone can buy an NFT with a credit card. So you it, it makes it easier for people um, to get into the space who are maybe first time users. One thing I've noticed here, Greg, if you scroll up slightly to the next to the previous section, uh, actually one more up, is this eco responsibility? Like we know, like Elon Musk made it abundantly clear why he uh, was backing away from from accepting Bitcoin for for Teslas just because of the energy usage. And there's been there's a lot of claims that say Bitcoin is not necessarily environmentally friendly in terms of mining it, uh, and Look, we're, we're dealing with climate change. You got it. We have to deal with that. Uh, but it's fascinating to see this type of an approach from a company uh, that's saying, look, we, we're, we're diving into this NFT industry, which is still very much a wild, wild west. Right. And, and we've seen like NFT valuations, uh, the cost of NFTs go up with, with people and it kind of goes down. Uh, and now, you know, one of us is like, hey, we're here. But we're also taking a, a, a secondary approach that we are doing, we are socially responsible, uh, we're doing something socially responsible to uh, to make this happen. Like, what does that say about the the industry itself, uh, the, the world of NFTs? Well, that's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting you pointed out Tezos. It's an energy efficient, what's called proof of stake blockchain that takes 2 million times less energy to mint an NFT compared to NFT platforms like OpenSea that we just looked at built on Ethereum's network. Um, so just like one quick stat about that that I happen to know is minting three NFTs um, you know, on one of has the carbon footprint equivalent to the weight of a snowflake. And if you compare that to a carbon footprint of some of the NFT platforms like OpenSea built on Ethereum's network, that could be equivalent, uh, one, some of them to 900 pounds of carbon emissions. And so that's why you saw, you know, Elon tweeting about 
uh, the environment because Ethereum network is a blockchain that uses proof of work consensus mechanisms. And that is the mechanism that is also used by Bitcoin. And it requires miners to compete, like to compute. They have to solve complex mathematical problems that validate these transactions uh, on the network for a chance to win a reward. That's their incentive. And so that requires this very expensive mining equipment that's uh, consuming large amounts of power. And so, you know, no matter how great the NFTs are, uh, if you're, you know, hurting the environment, then that's not something that I think artists or public figures uh, want their brand associated with. And so um, that's that's likely why um, Elon was was tweeting um, yeah. he's pulling out of do, do you Bitcoin. think that's a rate limiter to more people using them currently like a barrier to entry yeah like are, are people hesitant because of these i i think there has been more awareness yeah. about is it the impact of this right i think so yeah i think that artists really care about the environment and um they you know this is a cause that they are concerned about and so they want to be mindful of their ecological footprint um and you know that's that's just something i've noticed with artists is they're very particular about who they work with and um, they really care about uh, their their art being associated in the planet in a positive way. Yeah. So Curious, Sarah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Ken, I was, oh, sorry. I yeah. Little, uh, yeah go ahead, Greg. Actually. Oh, sorry. Um, the use cases that are are there use cases that you think we should be aware of of NFTs maybe or smart implementations or usage that you've seen that you know that might be good in source of inspiration for brands or for creators out there who are thinking about hey uh, this is an interesting concept you know um, you know early on it takes like you know when YouTube started people just put up all kinds of videos then eventually there started to become some design patterns for kinds of videos or use cases that normalize people get normalized too. Are there any of those that you, you might want to point out or that you like? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's some artists doing some really great work in the NFT space. And um, it's such an early uh, time that, you know, there are brands, I'm sure, that want to get involved. I'm sure, you know, a, bit, a bunch of big brands are all you know, having board meetings right now about NFTs, how do they get involved? Should we take this seriously? Is this just a fad um, or is this here to stay? Um, but, you know, similar to Nikea, Nokia, they held a board meeting and they circulated the iPhone on the day that the iPhone launched. And they said, is this a competitor to us or not? And they just kind of laughed and said, well, look how much market share we have. Look how much money we have in Nokia. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of years, it's like, it's all about Apple. It's all about the iPhone. So, you know, you got to really take the technology seriously. Like I said earlier, technology always wins. And um, NFTs are certainly, in my opinion, here to stay. It's the new frontier. So it, the time is now for, for brands to jump on the bandwagon. So Sarah, and in your experience, your oh my goodness, like your your vast experience of, of of being a developer, reporter, journalist, and and creator, and, and now like, is this what does it say in terms of like the, the world of, of of blockchain technology? Right, this this right this, I guess this rise. Although it's, it's been around for a while, but let's say this rise of blockchain technology, uh, this this decentralization. It, and we've we've seen the reports, we've he heard stories of how platforms, these traditional social media platforms, these Web 2.0, God bless those times when we all went to these conferences and heard about the latest for, from from uh, Twitter, from YouTube and and Twitch and everything like that. Of like, hey, we're launching these new features for for our users to create on there, and then we hear that oh, they just these platforms just quash these creators they just take away what they give us they take away right and then when the creators are like well what happened like you you said you're there for us and now you take it all away from us and now you're back again and with saying hey we're here for you and but you're like at some full point it's like all right you guys are just basically baiting us because you want us it's not like we need you at this point um 
and and there's a there, there's there's an article that from uh interview that jack conti from from patreon gave it's like the, the creators have a lot of leverage now right and and we, we talked about it last week and i think what you're talking about with this um with the this, this decentralization and the blockchain and nfts it's almost as if like a creator these days can just say you know what forget uh, minus the network effects that you get from traditional social media forget all everybody else we're just going to like they could a creator can just be completely decentralized and and run an, an eff efficient business is is that would, would would that be a fair statement to say and is that something you've seen in the wild oh yeah i mean just look at how much money uh you know facebook youtube and all these tech giants have made off of my content for the last 15 plus years. I mean, I get a revenue share of that, but it would be great if I could have all of it, <laughs> you know, just go straight to my audience and share my content and they can purchase it. They can own it. Um, and if I ever really want it, I can, you know, hit one of them up and buy it back. You know, it's, it's an economy. Uh, the content um, is, is, is open for multiple people to share in the ownership, um, which is also an exciting kind of crowdfunding technology that we're seeing enter the NFT space now uh, with startups uh, who are innovating new technologies for what's called fractional ownership. Um, so it doesn't have to be for the few elite at the top um, and platforms are enabling also NFTs to be sold at low purchase prices. Um, so not not all NFTs are be those sixty two million dollar um, you know beeples. You're gonna see very affordable NFTs, and if you get in with an artist early, just like a traditional artist, um, you buy their work early. You never know where they could go in their career. So it's really just about liking something, wanting something that's unique and different, and um, having that collector mentality. Uh, and just to know, I, from what I understand, though, you can't sell future revenues, right? In a traditional, no. NFT, right? No. Um, so, so you're you're just sort of like it's the one-time thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, and you said something, and I think, sorry, I think the thing that you and Ken are both pointing out, which I think is the powerful part, is maybe the real dynamic. To me, the real dynamic shift is that in the past you had to get big, right? Like, like you you didn't have an option. Right, like if you didn't get to tens of thousands or a hundred thousand or a million followers, subscribers, whatever it was, like you, you couldn't really live off of like that smaller amount, right? Um, and so I, I think like what we're seeing now is a transition to where it is possible now for a smaller audience to potentially be um, a bigger contributor uh, into the mix. Well, um, they, Sarah, this has been awesome. I thank you. Sorry, oh, but thank you for actually taking the time to explain some of these things to us because we're you know, new to this, and, uh, <laughs> figuring it out. Um, we'll, we'll have to launch our, our own can, NFT can be soon. Way more informed right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, we are about to go into the last part of our show, and I know you have to pop off. So by all means, thank you so much. We just wanted to say thanks again. We hope to have you uh, join us in the future. Um, but thanks. We will see you soon. And uh, we look forward to talking about anything and everything you do in the future. So uh, come back soon. Wonderful. So Thank you. But, for Sarah, Sarah, one thing, like how do people find more information about you? Give, give, give oh, our, yeah. give our listeners, uh, uh, how, how, how do they, how do they keep in touch? Sure. Uh, Sarah, ATV on Instagram, Sarah Austin on Twitter. Um, follow me. All right. Well, make sure you get out there and follow Sarah. She's, uh, definitely been in this for a while and has definitely been doing fun and interesting things. So I hope you will take a chance to uh, learn more about her and connect. All right, Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you for Thanks, being Sarah, here. Sarah, appreciate, appreciate it. Bye. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, we are now going into our After Dark series. So part of the show, which means that everyone listening, we want you to get on stage with us. So raise your hand. Uh, I see some of you out there on Twitter spaces. Um, but it's really just a chance to chat and catch up, reflect on what we we had heard um, or discussed today. So if you'd like to join us, raise your hand. I'm going to see if I can invite some friends up here to speak with us. Um, if you do come on up, just say where you're speaking from. Um, let me check on Clubhouse. we got some friends out there listening on Clubhouse as well. If anyone in Clubhouse wants to come on up, just raise your hand. We're happy to have you join us to 
join in conversation, share your thoughts. Um, it's an opportunity just to, you know, connect and uh, reflect a bit. Um, so, Ken, what about <clears> – <throat> what are your thoughts now? What are you going to mint as your first NFT? You know, I – I have no idea. Like it, it's the, the, there's so much potential based on what Sir was talking about. It's like, we could totally do that. And, and I mean, especially when you cut through the middleman and it's, it, but it's kind of, it makes sense, especially when you look at what uh, all the headlines in the past in terms of like, Hey, we're going to allow like YouTube's been experimenting with like uh, allowing uh, creators to sell merchandise uh, Instagram's uh, uh, about to do some sort of a shopping type of play as well. So it's only a matter of time before these big platforms are starting to see the potential of what's in this blockchain and uh, and with NFTs and everything to, and kind of incorporate that. But it's almost, but I think the what what the these social platforms are doing, it, they're holding the network reach as hostage. That's that's their that's their leverage over the creators, right? And but I think if they, if these companies, if, if the creators are like, you know what, as we're talking about with Earl, it's like, hey, let's go ahead and get rid of, uh, you know, bypass the traditional platforms and go straight with, you know, blockchain and and uh, do our own rally, uh, our creator coins and do NFTs. Who knows, right? They could very well make, we could see a whole new, uh, 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 we could definitely see this next generation of this creator economy to what, um the what neil was talking about it was it neil uh, talking about the no sorry it was dimitri oh my gosh dimitri was talking about the creator economy 2.0 like maybe we could start to see the, uh, this ushering in of this of this new era of the of the creator economy and it, it's like and and i don't i don't know what the, the like the sky's the limit and i mean i'm very now sarah's explained it to me i'm like okay great this is going to be now i understand it better uh i i know what everyone's talking about I think the execution, the 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 execution of creating one is still a little above my hair, but I'd be love to love to know more about that. I, I think the creation part is the easy part. It's the value part that I think is is challenging. Yeah. Um, Murray Murray actually has a a, a a fairly good a good comment here. He says that NFTs remind me of crypto kitties, cool but not required. They only have value if someone is willing to pay for them. I've seen NFTs backfire on major artists because their fans question their cost or value. That's I, always the case, right? It, it's like it's it, it's all about how much you can put something out there, and it could be wind up be like, oh, I'm gonna I'm hoping to make it make a uh, sixty nine million dollars like people to sell from art, but ultimately you basically get. Right, let's just be clear: most people are not going to sell uh, an NFT for sixty nine million dollars. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, I I'm um, I would say I wouldn't say, <clears throat> I'm cautious about them. I, I think the more they, at least for now, as a transitionary thing, the more they marry to that analog world, like the better. Like the thing that's interesting about like Gary's sort of NFT collection is he drew them all, mm -hmm. right? Like, and I think that there's something interesting about knowing it was like a hand-drawn thing by someone, right? Now, that's just me. Maybe it's just like, you know, I've been in technology my whole life, but like that seems rare, more re quote unquote real to me, right? There now, um, moments I think also seem very real to me, right? So if I if I'm imagining use cases, so I think like if I was in a live stream and someone was here as our guest, you know, I'm on the Joe Rogan podcast, and it's that little clip, you know, that moment as a commemorative piece, like where I can mint it, stamp it, push it out, and I know that it's there, and it, like you own that moment, it, you know, it feels a little like owning one of the stars, you know, like those those sites that sell you a star. Yeah. Uh, well, right. it's almost like you could see like that, that like a historic moment in time. Like, for example, when like, say, when Barack Obama announced that he's running for president. Right. Mm -hmm. Or when when it was announced that Barack Obama won, uh, was was elected president for the first time. I, like just taking that moment and making that as an NFT, like imagine like obviously now it's like someone good. has to make that. Right. I see Priscilla's joined us on Twitter spaces if you want to. On mic, feel free. Join in anytime. Um, I so I think, but I think it's got to be. There has to be a dynamic. You can't. It, it can't be. It has to be someone commemorating that moment in time. It can't just be that that moment in time existed, right? So you're a photographer. Mm -hmm. In the past, you know when you you would sell the you could sell like the perpetual rights to like you know to a photo that you've created, right? You could sell prints to it, mm -hmm. right? 
to me, it feels like when you, if you were, if you were to go down the NFT pathway, you would be converting one of your, fo- you'd sell the rights, you'd say, put the rights to your photo into that thing, right? Mm-hmm. Into an NFT and then sell that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I get it. That That's just like royalties and licensing and those kinds of things kind of is, have existed um, in the past, right? Um, like, because it's like, you know, kind of like a lot of photographers never sell their originals, right? They only sell like the prints, right? Mm-hmm. Um, unless it's like bespoke work, um, or something like that. Even then, like you, if you get married, right. Uh, they often don't give you the originals, right? Like they'll, they'll, they'll give you your prints, right. Or something like that. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, I, it is interesting where I'm curious, you know, about some of these other, now the, the use case that actually, I think, um, are really interesting is these NFT kind of like Gary's doing these NFTs as tickets, right? Because they are also one of a kind things. Those are things that were previously numbered, like things mm-hmm. that existed in a series that were numbered, et cetera. Right. Um, there's some interesting stuff there, I think like, because, okay, great. You have a ticket. There's only like one of these in the world. And this one ticket can get you into this one door. Right. Um, so I think like when it facilitates or enables access to a thing, for me, at least just mentally, it's easier to wrap my head around those, some of those use cases um, than understanding, say the value of owning like an original, the, the, because here's the thing, you don't own the rights to the, like, say, say you bought a YouTube video on an NFT, unless it's, and I saw this done, uh, the, remember Charlie bit my finger. Yep. Yep. Um, so recently that, that they, went on auction too. Yeah. They sold the NFT, but this is what I thought was powerful. They also deleted it off of YouTube. Well, no, they, they, there was thoughts that were going to take, I don't think they took it off of YouTube. Well, I talked to the guy who was running it and that was the, at least the plan. Right. Yeah, right. Right. Or at least to me, that made sense. Right. I was like, okay, so now like the original is actually back. You actually have the original, but you know, like there's just something to it. Right. Like, I mean, like, like, but the thing, the fact that it's always the way you consumed it originally was like in a print mm-hmm. or not of the original. Right. Like, like when you go to a museum, what do you do? You see, you see the original and then you buy the print, right? Or, or you take your phone and you take a picture. Yeah. And now, then so you have a digital in, copy. In the digital world, it's kind of the opposite. Like what we're talking about here is because you view the original with the exact same fidelity basically as the print, right? And then it's just literally bragging rights to own the original, I guess. Yeah. Because yeah. You're not, you don't own the royalty from it. You don't own the money from it. You don't necessarily own the right to create new prints of it, mm-hmm. right? Um, I don't know. It, it's a complicated area for sure. I think. No, I think there's there's a lot of promise with the NFTs. It's like, but it's still very that it's uh, what you could do afterwards is still very uh, uh, ambiguous. Uh, but but that's not necessarily a bad thing either, right? I mean, because it's like you, it's it's this wild again. We were talking about this wild wild west, like, and I think at some point we need like this type of a, a, a of a of a jar where we put in coins every time we, we utter that phrase, the wild, wild west, uh, you know, it's like, I'm basically 50 cents into this thing now, but the, the, what you could do with the, with this, these NFTs and, and this decentralization. And it's, and it's certainly worth diving into in future shows of how these decentralization can change this, this creator economy, especially when we are, when we we're talking about how these are now businesses, we are no longer individuals. Like we, for sure, for we sure. are businesses, and so in order for us to have, we do, we need to do what's best for the business, not necessarily, you know, mm. as an like I think it's, I mean, as an individual, it's like it's completely different mindset. But as a business, you got to do what's best to monetize so we, yourself. We do have Jeremiah here uh, joined us in from Twitter Spaces. Hey, hey Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Hey everybody. Hey Ken. How's it going? It's, it's a uh, discombobulated world because I can see Ken, but I, I only see like a little <laughs> line moving next to Jeremiah's face. What do you mean? <laughs> well, we're in a video stream also, but like I'm, I'm listening. You're, oh, you're got piped it. in. <laughs> got it. It's technology, um, Jeremiah. Technology. So I did a tweet like six minutes ago about NFTs, coincidentally, and oh. I identified that there's more features mm, for the yeah. modern NFT. Right. So, so b- can I just tell Please you? Share, share that. I'm what, looking at it. Share, share what you have here. <clears throat> so, digital art, which you just talked about. But the other thing that it could include, and it could be a mixture of these things, there's like eight things. It could be personalized. 
so the music digital artist BT, he's a DJ and musician, he launched an NFT and sold it. And then he made the art uh, personalized for the person who bought it. Also, there's social cred. So you see people, you see the DeFi friends and like uh, Bored Ape folks, they turn whatever NFT they bought, they turn that into their Twitter profile. The next one is the Gary V play, which is access to an event, which he is promising to do. So it's become a ticket. The next one is belonging to a community. So Bored Ape, when you buy their NFT, you get access to their, their, their yacht club, which is an online virtual community, kind of like Club Penguin, I think. Um, in the future, all games are going to be like this. Uh, the next one is derivative rights. So you can mix up the NFT if you purchased it and reuse it, like a Creative Commons ability to uh, change and alter. And then, of course, resale revenues and maybe other forms of revenues could be dividends or other things like that. So I think we're past phase one, which is just purchasing a license or a copy of an, the art. The modern NFT must include those things I just said in combination. That's it. Wow, I like this. This is great. Yeah, can you can you retweet it if you like it? Uh, yeah, we're not we're not sharing it at all. We're in the stream right now, and we're sharing it out. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm asking for a retweet. Damn it! <laughs> well, if I made an NFT of stream, your tweet, you Jeremiah. See, I retweeted it also. This is social audio. Don't talk to me about screen. <laughs> you're I, you're late with the audio part because we've but, been in video first. <laughs> but but Jer Jeremiah, I've I've just made an NFT of that tweet. Is that a little meta oh. tweet? <laughs> meta meta <laughs> NFT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh but no this is this is really really good jeremiah thank you like it's very oh, it's timely you. based on what we were talking about earlier and yeah so it was just like two minutes before this room start i came into this room unbelievable we're we're on the same wavelength i mean yeah, yeah. i mean the the, the digital <laughs> nft market kind of died out i mean they need to add more features right yeah. and so jeremiah do you think um these these types of or these models will be hardened into like software or do you think it stays kind of in this bespoke Both. arena that we've been sort of seeing so far. Yeah, I think you can do a mixture. Like, uh, so Greg and I are both part of Rally, and so we're the, it's, it's going to have an NFT feature. I actually am not sure which one of these features it will have, mm. but I'm sure like OpenSea and Rarible are trying to add on these things as well. Um, I mean, Gary V, what what did he use for his? Oh, it has something like nameless or something underneath it. I forgot. Uh, yeah. uh, it's V friends. Um, by the way, Jeremiah. Also, um, like there are things like that. I know if I've seen that at least for like turning tweets into uh, NFTs. Like there's a there's a, a website or something that does that. But yeah, he right. Gary V's using a service called Nameless. Nameless, which is called launching your custom NFT project has never been this easy. Let's see here. Uh, I'll put this into the stream as well if folks want to see it. Um, Nameless.io, in case anyone's interested. Uh, and if you're watching, you can also see it here. Um, but yeah, they provide, oh, so they provide the whole thing, actually. That, that whole thing is actually, v, oh, actually, VFriends, maybe Gary probably owns this company. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, like, VFriends is in the is in the header image, but um, he Maybe maybe these were you know um, combined forces at the same time, right? Yeah, I think he invested in it. Yeah, I would imagine he did. Anything um, with V in, in it is is Gary associated. Yeah, mm. yeah. interesting. Uh, so you can so with this you upload any type of media asset. You can bundle up these NFTs and then it, it basically is like a stripey kind of thing as well. Yeah, I mean it's going to be like um, oh you know any. Any type of like access to an event will probably become an NFT. Tickets, in right? Yeah, yeah. Tickets, uh, club access to anything like, like you could imagine clubhouse rooms could become NFT, right? To get to those rooms, Facebook groups could have an NFT. You see, this is where I prefer the the, the tokens, though, Jeremiah, because right. I, I, well, I feel like the, the one-off production for like the, like membership type of things. I mean, I guess, you know, like if you got a membership card, the analog world would be that membership card for a year. But since these may not die, you know, maybe, I, but they have a minting date, right? So you could use that potentially. You could say, I mean, you can make it programmable. There's, I mean, the, yeah. the thing with the NFT is it's not programmable, but well, actually, I'm not sure that's true, but I guess you could wrap it. Yeah. 
This, this uh, nameless thing supports something they call evolution NFTs, which says don't get stuck with typos and errors in your digital collectibles. Our evolution NFTs allow you to make changes on the fly. Interesting. So Jeremiah, I have a question I mean, about your about your tweet. Eventbrite. So imagine Eventbrite and Evite and in you know upcoming every type of event or company or Facebook events has an associated NFT. Can you can you imagine that? Go ahead, Ken. So it, based on uh, what you're talking about with you know digital art, personalized assets, social credit uh, events, and and everything else. Who is the, what is the company or who's the one that should be responsible or, or will be the individual or group that will establish these type of protocols or, or services? I don't know, but the blockchain community will say this, well, it should be a smart, smart contract that's distributed. Duh. That's what they would say, <laughs> but that is, but you still need a neck to choke when you're, when you're. Uh, get selling tickets to things right so i suppose it will be the person who posted it for sale so it, so the then original, let me amend that the the original person who created it and posted it for sale will be responsible for fulfillment hmm. actually i don't know let's see if we I get james in here by the way james you listening on twitter spaces has minted some nfts himself it, I, have you seen uh james's uh nfts um, no, let's go see it. Let's let's hear about it, James. Tell us what's going on. Uh, he's he's still a listener. Let's hope he, he comes on up. Um, but he did some. Um, he's been using um, what's that uh, AI thing called again? Um, the GPT thing. Oh, GPT three. Yeah, he's been doing some like generative art uh, using mm -hmm. AI, which I th it's been very fun ones. Uh -huh. Um, uh, very interesting. James's ones actually feel kind of like art exhibits that I would go look at, like in a museum. I'm looking at his feed right now he has some super cool ones uh as well that he's done all right here he goes james hey, tell hey us. james welcome yo yo, yo. Hey, james hey what's up is your uh, you avatar an <laughs> nft it is are, are you an that nft was... how do we know you're really you <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, gonna be a high price <laughs> <laughs> So James, um, you've been doing some awesome experiments with NFTs as well. Um, we were just having a talk to, we were curious about your thoughts on, you know, what, what made you start experimenting with them and, um, and, and sort of what have you learned in the process of putting it out there? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I was, yeah, I wasn't really into the NFT or even the blockchain space for a long time. Uh, what really got me into it was, uh, just sort of seeing, um, in a sort of outlet for a lot of my digital kind of, I didn't even consider art before, but I've been making sort of viral creations that uh, were sort of literary in basis. Uh, they were kind of weird. And I, I figured like, oh, it, it felt like a lot of, you know, um, a lot of NFT platforms were, well, they are digitally native, right? And the fact that value creation, sort of value transfer is baked into the protocol uh, you know, it just made me think like, oh, and it felt like also the audience is more, more receptive to weird things uh, in general um, versus sort of the old genres uh, that that we see in kind of Web 2.0. But also like because uh, I've been involved in sort of writing short stories and various other literary outlets. Um, so, yeah, I've been experimenting with just like making some um, interesting little like AI generative art. Uh, and mostly been experimenting on Hick et Nunk, uh, which is a Tezos-based uh, NFT uh, platform. So, James, <laughs> having uh, coming from somebody that has very little technical prowess, um, to was this an easy thing to set up, like to to do these things yourselves? Like, how much skill James, do, you, do you need to, to do? a highly technical person. It might not be the best sort of <laughs> I was, So here's, well, here's, the, here's the analogy. If you like consider all the Ethereum platforms like OpenSea, Foundation, Rarible, et cetera, and you compare that to the Tezos uh, platforms like Hic Hic at Nunk, um, which I don't like the name, by the way. It's just like impossible to pronounce. Uh, I just, let's just call it Hen. Um, it's like Hen is like... If, if if foundations like the Sotheby's, Hen is like the the really spare Brooklyn loft with like 
punk rock, <laughs> like, uh, like, <laughs> like blasting and there's no, ha- you know, there's no handrails or anything. It's like, it's pretty bare bones. And it actually reminds me of the early days of love, the web 2.0 uh, platforms uh, that were out there, um, which is actually very exciting because I felt like, I feel like that platform has actually the most experimental art uh, that's out there. And it is also, I believe, the platform that has the highest share of people who are both creators, but also are collecting. So I think that's really interesting. That's why I've been investing more into that platform specifically. And I believe it also has now um, surpassed DAU uh, versus OpenSea. Uh, so just in terms of the number of wallets that are interacting uh, with uh, those smart contracts. Um, but yeah, in terms of getting it set up, yeah, it's not user friendly. It's like anti user friendly. I, I feel like they actually do it <laughs> on purpose because like they want people who who are really like want to do it for the intrinsic value of like creating. Uh, it is the least user friendly um, uh, platform I've ever used in my life. Probably. <laughs> um, it's like you're. It's, so it's like you you finally figured out found the holy grail, and therefore you're allowed to to live forever. But if you you like. You can't tough luck. You you don't get it. It's like this sure. really a little, weird a quest. Bit like that. And I think that. And also, they just started like three months ago, which is crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and it's it's basically like over overshadowed in terms of DAU. So I have a lot of faith in like the future of that platform. I think it's very bright, um, but it is hard to use today. But there's a lot of and it's super decentralized. There's no like company behind it. So it's unlike Foundation and various other ones. Um, it's just a lot of volunteers like making the platform from scratch. Um, and and this is the uh, on, right. yeah. And this is which wh- what's this platform again? It's called Hick et Nunc, which is <laughs> Latin for here and now. <laughs> so it's Hick et Nunc dot X Y Z. Um, so that so that's the piece. So I started on Foundation, did a few sort of weird AI poetry stuff there, and I moved over to Hick et Nunc, and I so I made a piece uh that was uh that went viral it was called things are a little crazy right now it's on screen um, right now by the way um over here oh i don't think that's the one. Oh, is it oh no uh, i have it um i have it on the oh, yeah, in, screen, in the yeah. live stream yeah i'll, I'll put it yeah. in to the tweet as well yeah so that was very surprising so that's uh that was a piece that you know i maybe would have made Jeez, right just like it's kind of a fun little piece that's uh, like two AI bots trying to schedule meetings together and they just never schedule it. So it's you know, very, very apropos for like the you know, COVID Zoom times. Um, but because it was also an NFT, uh, because it went viral on Twitter, it was able to, I, I was able to sell it for like over $10,000. Like if you, depending wow. on how you would uh, like do the conversion rate at Tezos. So there were like 15 limited editions and I basically like priced it higher each time. And I was very surprised. Like, um, but I think that's, I would attribute that to its viral nature on Twitter. So there are definitely a lot of speculators on Hit, Hit at Nunk as well, who are collectors, uh, who are just like tracking prices of these things and going up and seeing like the var- artist values go up. So there are definitely a lot of those folks who are uh, buying and then immediately trying to resell. Actually, someone did resell it for, I think about $20,000 on the secondary market. Um, so that was a, that was a crazy week for me. So that, then that really proved to me that like, wow. Like people, I like it because like people enjoyed the thing for free, right? On Twitter. Mm-hmm. And I even self-hosted on my site as well, just in case, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, that, yeah. that, well, <laughs> hey, God, not, like, it's still like a little unstable at that point in time. That was like a month ago. Actually, they did go down for a little bit. <laughs> um, but, but also like for people who want, who like, like, like the art and want to support me or support. Um, I also like donated all of this to uh, all the proceeds to um, organizations against AAPI hate. So that mm, like helps nice. it as well. Um, they can support it. And it's not like supporting through like, oh, some kind of tipping me- mechanism. It's not like some other like side channel thing. It's like the channel, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that's the cool thing uh, about NFTs because everyone in- <laughs> can enjoy it. And then you can, in the primary channel, support the creator, right? Yeah. And then the secondary sales as well because I get a 15% cut uh, of those. Oh, wow. Is that configurable or is that just built into the platform? Uh, it's configurable. Um, you can set it. I don't know what the range is, but you know, from from zero percent all the way up to maybe like thirty percent or something. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that's the constraint on. I think it's the constraint about Hick Hick and Nung, uh, actually uh, places. So so James, it, it, you've gone from 
being an entrepreneur, developer, to going to write short form books, uh, novels, uh, in in your this new chapter of your life, and now you're kind of moving in. I mean, you're a creator in your own right, and now you're doing NFTs. Like, was there any particular rhyme or reason, or is it just more of your of the curiosity that you have as someone that's a fan of technology and and you know a, 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 an expert in in, the, in there, and you just kind of want to get your hands dirty. Yeah, I sort of see it as like seasons of life. Right. Uh, I, I do follow my curiosity a lot of times. Uh, I see I, specifically why I got into this is I was um, actually a little frustrated with like sort of the publishing industry in general. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious about other kinds of models that could actually uh, be experimented with for writers uh, mm -hmm. in that creative space. Because I feel like that um, a lot of a lot of those platforms are like very aged. Right. And it's uh, I think NFTs do provide an opportunity here. Um, I mean, what I'm creating there is not necessarily like literary, maybe you would call it like hyper literature or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are definitely some folks who are experimenting, um, for literary NFTs as well. So I have part of this, uh, group called crypto writers. Um, so there's a whole cadre of, you know, poets and short story writers, novel writers, um, uh, who are experimenting with NFTs, whether, you know, you're selling one page of a novel at a time, um, or there's this, um, cool initiative by uh, Simon. He runs uh, something called Untitled Frontier. Um, he has a, he's building this platform where sort of you're like building a shared universe together. And then uh, the funding model could be that you sell artifacts from that universe. So imagine uh, just like just like how, you know, I, I think Star Wars, like they, they sell like um, uh, collectibles, right? Uh, whether it's um, lightsabers, you know, like numbers, etc. Like imagine if your favorite science fiction novel is like, oh, you can actually buy like, you know, maybe the outfit that like the main character is wearing or some artifact inside that universe. And so then these novels or short stories could be for free. But then if you really get into it, you can buy things that are like elements in that story. So I think that's that's an interesting, hmm. interesting model. Is this where you think Mirror fits in, I guess, in this ecosystem? Is this kind of like... Uh, and, and what you just described sounds like next level past that, but um, it, it, have you looked at Mirror or thought about it or tried it yet? I haven't tried it, uh, but I think, it's, I think that's interesting too. It's like being able to have shared ownership in, um, a, in a particular essay or kind of like artifact, right? Mm -hmm. The actual reading. Um, and I believe, yeah, they, they did have a couple novels that were essentially crowdfunded um, from that platform as mm -hmm. well. I think it's interesting because it is different from sort of the Kickstarter where you sort of get a little trinket. It's like, oh, well, you actually like have ownership, a stake, right? In yeah. that novel. Yeah. And like, uh, I guess royalties like, uh, and other like pro could profit from it uh, based on how well it does. So I, I think that's interesting. But so I way, think that, yeah, we should have all of these, right? All I, these experiments should be happening. <laughs> I had an interesting idea, you know, um, James, we all have, a lot of us have kids here. Um, you know, why don't we make 529 funds and just put all of our kids' artwork in there and let the grandparents <laughs> and everyone else buy it? <laughs> so, 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 Greg, are you are you saying that you're starting a new company uh, called uh, uh, Lil Grams uh, NFT that's yeah, going to aggregate uh, everything? Uh, uh, five tw yeah, Lil Grams X Y Z, of course, right? Um, yeah, you're going to mean, NFT all the artwork. Really I've been tempted to mint some of Re uh, my son Remy's uh, artwork, but Rem well, Remy um, is pretty good, though I must say. So. <laughs> I think I think he's pretty good. You know, I'm biased, uh, but you know, he doesn't really understand NFTs, right? He just, yeah. you know, like I don't. Like, so I, it feels a little weird doing that. He may want of, it back, you know. <laughs> and also, like I don't know, like what if he does grow up and become a serious artist, and then it's like this is forever in the blockchain, and then it's like, oh god, these pieces are like following me throughout my entire well, life. You, but you know, you could, you like, you, if you look at this nameless thing, right, you could potentially create something like this, make it private, and then basically invite people to, I don't, I, I really think there's something potentially interesting there because like, to your point, if they did become an artist, um, these early works would actually, you know, it's the, it's the ideal vehicle for like actually creating value for that, that buyer. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I, I just feel like the, the, there's a bit of a consent problem. <laughs> without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I do think it'd be interesting. It's a way for people to, to definitely give you money basically. Right. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and it's something that only a grandparent largely can find valuable. <laughs> it's like, yeah, who, who, it's needs, who needs Christmas presents or anything like their holiday presents or birthday presents? Like, look, you just like, just get, here you go. We'll just buy it, buy this NFT of, of Remy's work. It'll go towards his college fund. There you go. It's like, who needs bonds <laughs> and everything like that? Or, or yeah, giving an NFT to a kid for Christmas yeah. is like probably the worst. It's like gift. the old uh, stock like, bonds, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like you'll you'll thank uh, me what you'll thank me when James. you can afford to go to college. Okay. Hold on, we got Jeremiah has a suggestion for James. James, I suggest that uh, you build a virtual avatar AI of your child and have it create NFTs, and you can sell that without any emotional guilt. Oh my God creepy <laughs> yeah that's, or, that's and awesome. you can take original that's remy works and then you know like run Summary them through. creating fake fake work for my son <laughs> yeah, well, just, just, oh no that's a can, problem can't can gpt3 do that for you you know it's like <laughs> have yeah, sam can, altman yeah. do it for you you know <laughs> yeah just connect yeah gpt well i mean that's the future right connect gpt3 to uh well clip the gpt3 to gans right <laughs> they can like just create everything from, from scratch and then uh, and then, and then, then patch in everything. and then patch in ms paint into there so it looks more like a kid's thing <laughs> <There's> <laughs> oh, yeah. well kai's if power tools the hen platform like that's like that that is the aesthetic actually a lot of the glitch art and it's yeah. out there is like okay yeah it is purposely looking so it's supposed to look like uh it is from ms paint but it's cool <laughs> yeah, I, I see. Uh, Zar Zarex has joined us. Uh, how you doing? Hello, hello. Welcome. Thanks for joining the convo. Oh, did we lose him? Nope. Oh, hold on. Nope. Zarex. Yeah. There we go. Hello. Speaking oh. French. Ah, uh, sorry. Well, I, some people might know French, <laughs> oh. but, um, well, this has been a fun episode. Actually, I'm, I'm really glad we had, uh, one, some of our friends were able to participate, which is always fun. And then also just, uh, some hyper relevant experience, uh, which goes a long way, uh, in these convos. Um, but, uh, we are at time. So I think it's about time for us to wrap up. Um, thank you, everybody, for participating from Twitter Spaces, from Clubhouse, uh, folks on Facebook, on Twitch, on YouTube. <clears throat> Next week, we'll be on LinkedIn again if Ken doesn't delete my stream. Um, <laughs> but uh, tune in next week because we do have uh, Alex from Get Vocal uh, back. Uh, we've got Fernando Parnas from Superfans coming up the week after that. Mike Donahue from Subtext after that. And then Matt Zuvella, who was originally going to be here this week, but we had to reschedule him, will be here from Fame Pick on July 7th. Um, head over to createdeconomy.com if you would like to uh, get the show notes. We'll probably have them up in an hour and a half or so. Uh, but you can also find out about uh, past episodes. You can sign up for our newsletter. You can also apply to be a guest if you have a topic that you think you'd love to share with us about the creator economy. So, Ken, with that, uh, just final goodbyes. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's been fun. This is always a, a highlight of the week. Yeah, I mean, four episodes in, like. Who knew we could we could have such amazing conversation again? Who like, knew we could be consistent? Well, I mean, might as well. <laughs> well, we're, 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 we're virtually got to have to be right with time constraints and everything like that. But no, this has been great. Uh, thank you to Sarah. Thank you to to Jeremiah, to to James, uh, and everybody that joined us on on this uh, on this show. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you guys again. Uh, if you guys have topics that you want us to talk about, feel free to drop it uh, on our website at created.show. Um, again, as, as Greg's talked about more, all, everything will be on uh, createdeconomy.com later on. Of course, follow us on Twitter. We, we love that. Uh, so we at can create economy on Twitter. Create, yep. And then we also, we are on the YouTube. Uh, so bit.ly the, uh, slash created economy, get us there so we can uh, get, get some more uh, creator tools. Woo. Cause it's all about followers, right? Yeah. So, so uh, we are here Wednesdays, just a reminder, uh, Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Mountain Time, 2 p.m. Pacific, and what's that, 5 p.m. 
Eastern time. 5 p.m. So, Eastern, yeah. All we right. Need, we need like little clocks or something. Yeah, we need little really clocks or something. <laughs> um, but thank you, everybody. It's been a, always a fun experience. Uh, next week, we'll be back with more news uh, and another deep dive. Uh, but I think next week we're talking about podcasting, actually. So uh, if that's we, we have about. nothing. We have no idea what, what that's about at all. I know what our our guest is, is, is an expert in. So so it's all about education. So, so yeah. bring it on. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Have a great week. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. See ya.